And welcome to my talk on OPSI, fast OPRF, and circuit PSI from Vector OE. This is work I did at my time at home of the University of Berlin and joint work with Peter Rindo from Visa Research. So, this talk is going to be about private set intersection. So, let's quickly introduce what that is. Private set intersection, or short PSI, is a protocol between two parties, Alice and Bob, and they each have some set of input elements. The goal for the parties is to learn the items they have in common. So in this case, the blue triangle and the red circle. So if at the result of the protocol, all the parties learn is their intersection of the sets and nothing beyond that, then we call that PSI protocol actually secure. So there are many variants of PSI protocols. In particular, we could have, for example, both parties uh, have both parties receive the output, or only have one party receive the output. We could have associated values with the inputs, or we could have the output secret shared, which allows us to uh, subsequently perform a different secure computation on the secret shared output without the parties learning the intermediate results. Okay, so in the last couple of years, the most common approach to build private set intersection protocols was based on oblivious pseudo random functions. What is an oblivious pseudorandom function, or OPRF for short? Well, it's the distributed equivalent of a PRF in uh, the centralized setting. So Alice here has the key to the PRF, and she's going to get that as a result of the uh, OPRF protocol. Bob, on the other hand, only learns the output of the OPRF on certain input values that he chooses at the beginning. So. Here, for example, Bob chooses two input values and gets the corresponding output values. Alice, on the other hand, who has the key, can compute the PRF value on any input she chooses offline. So the main observation here is that Alice can compute F locally, whereas Bob only interactively and only on a fixed number of inputs. Now, what do OPRFs give us? So how can we uh, use OPRFs to build uh, PSI protocols? Well. The approach is actually quite simple. Bob simply inputs all his elements into the OPRF protocol and in turn gets the corresponding PRF values. Alice gets the OPRF key and now can locally compute the PRF values for all of her inputs. And now she's just going to send those over in a shuffled order to Bob, who can then compare each of them with the OPRF values he got for himself. And as soon as he has a match, he knows that the corresponding input was in the intersection. So that's a very simple PSI protocol, and the work I'm presenting here follows the same approach. So we're also going to build an OPRF function, but we're going to build one that's more efficient than previous work, and that is also going to give us more efficient PSI protocol in return. So the basic protocol underlying our OPRF construction is called vector OE. So I'm also quickly going to introduce what that is. Vector OE. So OLE here stands for Oblivious Linear Evaluation, is uh, basically a correlation generator that, again, can be run between two parties. So the vector OLE generator outputs three vectors, A, B, and C, and a scalar delta. So here, Alice gets B and delta, and Bob gets two vectors, A and C. And all of these are pseudo-random, but with the property that they are correlated. And the correlation is such that C equals A delta plus B. You can think of this as an additive secret sharing of a vector scalar product. So A delta is the product, and then C and minus B are the secret shares. Now, there are several works that explore how to build vector OLE generators, and we're building on them to build our OPRF construction. Now, how can we get from vector OLE to an OPRF? Now, suppose for a minute that A, B, and C are very long. In particular, that they are exponentially long. That means they have as many elements as there are possible elements for a PSI protocol. Of course, in practice, that's not going to be possible. But uh, assume we have that for a moment, and then we're going to see how we can actually get a realistic OPRF. So if we had such, such a long vector only correlation, and if, in addition, Bob could choose one of the vectors, A, to be zero at certain positions, we could have an OPRF by Bob choosing A to be zero at all the positions that corresponds, uh, correspond to his input elements. So if A of x is zero at all the positions of Bob's inputs, then at these, 
B and C will be equal. So in irrespective of, of delta, which is still random. And now if we just put those into a random oracle, we immediately get a PRF. And it's one that Bob can evaluate at all of his inputs. And Alice can actually evaluate anywhere because the key is going to be just Alice's vector B. Now observe that at positions where Bob doesn't program A to be zero, C and B will uh, not be equal. And that means that the corresponding uh, result of the OPRF will not be equal. So we still have the property that Bob can only evaluate the OPRF at positions he chose in the beginning. Now, that sounds very simple, right? But of course, there are several problems with this approach. First of all, with a, just a vector-only generator, Bob cannot choose A since it's generated pseudo-randomly. Secondly, as I said, A, B, and C would have to be as large as the OPRF domain. And that's not realistically possible with any vector-only generator. And thirdly, if Bob acts maliciously, he could just program A, so if he can program it at all, he can program A to be zero in more than n positions, right? So you can program it actually to be zero anywhere, and therefore learn Alice's key, and uh, that makes the OPRF protocol not secure. So I'm now going to show you how to fix each of these issues, and at the end, what we're going to get is an actual OPRF protocol from vector only. So for the first problem that Bob cannot choose A, we're going to use a standard construction that uh, reduces the problem of a chosen input OLE correlation to a pseudo-random OLE correlation. So if Bob cannot choose A, but he can instead choose a different vector P, he can just send P plus A to Alice. And here A is going to act as a one-time pad to mask P. And now Alice's key just becomes uh, B plus delta times A plus P. And this again uh, satisfies the uh, vector only correlation. So we still have correctness. But now Bob can actually choose his vector. And uh, that allows him to program it in exactly the way we want him to. So, OK, that was simple. And that's a non construction. So nothing new. Here. The second problem is somewhat more involved. So. For this ideal uh, vector only protocol, we would need A, B, and C to be as large as the full OPRF domain. Since we cannot have that, we're going to go a different approach instead. And we're going to assume we have a public exponentially large matrix M. So this matrix, again, is as large as the vectors we would ideally want to have, but it's uh, not very wide. So it's very tall, but not very wide. And the number of columns is just slightly more than the number of inputs that Bob chooses. What Bob is now going to do is choose his vector P such that the product of this exponentially large matrix M and P is zero at the positions he wants it, he wants it to be. And that then allows us to uh, use a vector only correlation of only size M. And M is size O of N, so it's, it's quite small. Um, yeah, so that's. Uh, see how, how that looks. Here on the left, we have the matrix M. Again, it's very tall, and it cannot be represented anywhere in memory. But we can index it by the elements that uh, we have in, in Bob's uh, input set. So Bob can just select the rows that he wants from this matrix M. And we have a short vector P, and we want the product of M and P to be 0 at exactly the positions that correspond to Bob's inputs. How can we achieve that? Well. It's rather simple. We just choose the rows of M that correspond to the inputs and then solve the linear system, MP equals zero. And we're going to see several approaches that make this linear system solving actually quite efficient. As for the third problem, that a malicious Bob can make now MP zero in more than N positions, well, we're not going to actually program zero there, but we can program any value we want. And in particular, we can program a random value that's derived from the, the input element. So here, we're going to use a random oracle and use the output of the random oracle as the value uh, programmed for uh, m times p. So here, again, the only thing that changed to the uh, previous image was that now mp has the hash of the corresponding row in, uh, in its value. And the intuition why this solves the problem that we had before is that um, here, if Bob was able to program P in a way that 
contains more than n positions or more than m positions, then that was course would correspond to compressing a random oracle. Since that's not possible information theoretically, that means that Bob cannot find a vector p that uh, programs more than n positions. And so that ensures that he can only query the OPRF at n positions. So this gives security from the perspective. Now, OK, the question is, we want this large public matrix M that has the property that Bob can efficiently choose, uh, choose submatrices of it, so can efficiently index into it and choose a row that corresponds to an input. And additionally, we want him to efficiently solve this linear system. So M at the chosen rows times P should be equal to the hash of the uh, row index. Now, there are several Straubman approaches that we can take here. One would be to just take a pseudorandom matrix. So each row of M will be defined by a pseudorandom generator that is just a, a PRG of the input I, of the, the index I. Now, that is still quite concise. So if we do that pseudorandomly uh, over a field F or, or over a binary field, then uh, we only need roughly O of N uh, columns in this matrix for it, for it to have a solution. But the problem is that now finding that solution takes cubic time because the best we can do here is Gaussian elimination. So that's quite inefficient in terms of computation. Another approach that's also been uh, cited in the literature quite often is Agarbo Bloomfield's. So here we don't have completely pseudo random rows, but instead we have a binary matrix that is only one at a very few positions. So here, the number of positions is uh, equivalent to the statistical security parameter of lambda. And that means we only have lambda non-zero elements at each row. So that means we can also, we can solve the linear system in linear time, since it is a sparse system. But the issue now is that uh, we need a very, uh, a very large number of columns in the matrix to ensure there's a solution at all. And so that means the communication becomes quite inefficient since the size of the rows is also the size of the vector only correlation that we have to generate. So one approach that is both efficient in terms of computation and communication is what we call the Vandermont solver. So here M is going to be the Vandermont matrix. That is each row is going to contain all the powers of the row index from the zeroth to the N minus first. So now multiplying a row times any vector V is the same as evaluating a polynomial with coefficients from V at the row index X. Now, if our matrix has th that structure, that means that uh, solving the linear system, so taking the rows of uh, M that corresponds to Bob inputs and solving M X times P equals to the hashes of X, that's the same as interpolating a polynomial where the coefficients are p, um, and the polynomial is over uh, the rows in the row indices x. Then computing the inverse, so uh, multiplying the matrix mx times any vector v, is the same as multipoint polynomial evaluation. So here's an example of how a polynomial could look like. So uh, at any point, uh, point x, we want the polynomial to have the uh, hash of x as the value. At any point that is not in uh, Bob's input set, we don't care. We just uh, care about the uh, exact inputs that Bob uh, has. So the nice thing is that the number of columns this matrix needs to have is exactly n. So it needs to have the powers from 0 to n minus 1. So there's n many of them. So that means communication-wise, we're as efficient as we can get. Computation-wise, we know that polynomial uh, interpolation and multipoint evaluation can be done in uh, time n log squared n. But ideally, we would like to get rid of that log square factor. So ideally, we would have to, to have uh, would like to have something that's linear. And for that, we have a second approach that we also present in the paper, and that's based on previous work, and uh, in particular, the called the Paxos solver. So. The Paxos solver is nice because it has a linear time encoding and decoding algorithm. And also the rows have size O of n. So they are larger than n, but only by a constant. So the idea of Paxos is inspired by cuckoo hashing, and I'm not going to go 
too much into it, but I'm going to try to give a high level intuition. So in cuckoo hashing, we have two hash functions that uh, map to a space of a fixed size here m. And exactly two of uh, exactly the two points that correspond to uh, these hash functions will have set one bits. Additionally, we will have O of lambda uniform bits for each row of our matrix. So if we construct the matrix in that way, then we can actually solve the linear system in time linear in N. And how that works is by observing that the left part, so the left part of this matrix that has only very few one bits, is in, has in most cases very few cycle if you interpret it as a graph. So um, if you just take all the col columns that are part of cycles together with the dense part on the right, and you solve that using Gaussian elimination, for example, then the remainder of this matrix can be solved very efficiently in uh, linear time. And so that's the approach that was taken in this uh, crypto 2020 paper. And that's uh, basically uh, the same thing uh, we're going to use here. So now we have two approaches to uh, generate this matrix M. One is a bit more communication efficient, that is the van der Mond solver. And the other one is very efficient in terms of computation and also pretty efficient in terms of communication. That's the Paxos. So how does the full OPRF protocol now look like? We start with a vector only generator. So Alice gets delta and B, Bob gets A and C, such that C equals A delta plus B. Now Bob uses whichever solver he chooses, so either the Van der Mond, uh, interpolation or the Paxos encoding to encode a vector P such that the matrix indexed by his uh, elements equals to the hashes of the elements. He then masks the vector P with the output of the uh, vector only generator and sends P prime over to Alice. Now Alice just adds delta times P prime to, to uh, her output of the vector only correlation and uh, that's her key. And now you can see that both parties actually can compute locally the, the values of the OPRF. But the property here is that the values will only be equal for uh, elements that Bob in the beginning programmed to uh, be equivalent uh, to the hash uh, in, in the linear system sorting case. So now that's the full OPRF protocol. And if we plug that in into the uh, PSI from OPRF construction, we actually get a secure uh, PSI protocol. Well, I said in the beginning, you might also want to have a variant of PSI where the output is secret sharing. So that is useful if, for example, the two parties want to perform a subsequent computations on the output without learning the intersection elements themselves, but only a function of the intersection elements, for example, the sum. So an approach to do that uh, that was presented in 2019 is to make the OPRF programmable. That means that Alice can fix the value of the OPRF for her inputs Y to a certain value that she chooses. So if we have such a programmable OP OPRF, then we can use just uh, cuckoo hashing and generic circuit-based PSI to uh, circuit-based MPC to obtain a circuit PSI protocol. And we're going to follow the same approach. And so for that, I'm going to show you how to make the OPRF that I just presented programmable. So here at the beginning, Alice has, in addition to her inputs Y, she also has the labels Z. So she wants to program uh, the OPRF in such a way that for Y1, the output is Z1. Now we start by just running the simple OPRF protocol that I showed you. And so Bob inputs his elements, elements x1 to xn and uh, in turn gets output uh, PRF values of x1 to xn. Alice, on the other hand, gets the key and can now locally evaluate this PRF on all of her inputs. She does this, uh, does this and subtracts the result from her labels z. So observe that now this z prime is essentially pseudorandom if you don't know the corresponding y values. Now, if we now have an encoding that uh, maps these Y values to these pseudorandom Z values, and that also hides the uh, values uh, Y that Alice inputs, then we can send that over to Bob without revealing anything. So 
what we did in our paper was we analyzed the Paxos solver and saw that in fact it can be transformed into such an encoding. So in particular, at any point where in the linear system solving of the Paxos encoding, uh, where there is a choice between multiple uh, options, if we just choose randomly, then this satisfies the condition. So as long as Z prime is super random, nothing is revealed about Y by this encode vector P. And since Z prime is masked with OPRF outputs, which by definition are pseudo random, then uh, this suffices here. So Alice can encode this vector P and send it over to Bob. And now both parties can locally decode the Paxos uh, encoded vector on their inputs and add the results to the OPRF values that they already computed. So this gives them the programmable OPRF value. And if you do the computation, you will see that uh, for X and Y, if so if X is uh, part of Alice's input, then actually the output of F of X will be equal to uh, the corresponding label Z that Alice uh, input into her computation. So we have correctness here. And as I said, since P doesn't reveal anything, since Z prime is sort of random, this uh, also ensures uh, privacy for, for Alice's input. So with that, let's evaluate the protocols that I just presented. So we implemented both the standard PSI protocol as well as the circuit PSI, PSI protocol. And for the standard PSI, we also have a semi-honest and a malicious variant. So this now is the semi-honest variant of PSI for a rather small input set size. And we compare it with the previous work that is the Paxos paper. Then another uh, work by Chase and Yao from uh, 2020. And then the classic KKRT PSI protocol. And we see that in the LAN, still KKRT is the fastest, even though our new protocol has the lowest communication. Um, we also see that if we exclude a one-time setup phase that is only present in our uh, protocol, then actually our protocol is the fastest in any setting that's not the LAN. If we include, on the other hand, this one-time setup, then the protocol of Chase and Meow is still faster. However, if we increase the input size, so if we now go to a million input elements, then we see that in very bandwidth constraint uh, settings, our protocol is the fastest, even if we include the one-time setup. And that becomes even more apparent if we go to 2 to the 24, so uh, really large input sizes. So here in the LAN, still KKRT is the fastest, but in any bandwidth constraint setting, the fact that we have such a low uh, communication in the VOL PSI, uh, gives us an advantage in terms of computation time as well. In the malicious setting, we see a similar picture. So here I have all the three input sizes at once. And we'll see that uh, only in the LAN, the protocol, uh, the original Paxos PSI protocol is faster than ours by a small margin. But then in bandwidth constraint settings, uh, ours is faster again. For circuit PSI, we actually have two choices in our implementation. Um, and that comes due to the fact that the circuit PSI at the end has a generic circuit-based uh, MPC protocol. So we implemented that using GMW, and for that we have a choice of OT implementation that we use. And here we can either use the standard IKNP OT extension or a more communication efficient one that is silent OT. And we implemented both of them and compared them, and we see that in fact in bandwidth constraint settings, silent OT outperforms IKNP. Both of them in turn outperform the uh, original uh, circuit PSI protocol that ours is based on in terms of communication. And then at least one of them outperforms them in terms of uh, total running time. So that concludes my talk. And I just want to quickly highlight two related works that uh, have been presented at crypto this year. And that can also be used to improve the protocols that are presented here. So one of them is Silver, which is a faster vector only generator. So we used one from CCS 2019. And what's nice about Silver vector relay is that it's both faster in terms of computation and communication than the one we use. So this will strictly improve the PSI protocol if you implement it a uh, uh, mole based PSI with the Silver role. A second paper uh, that appeared at Crypto was uh, about oblivious key value stores. And those are basically more efficient variants of Paxos. And again, just like the original Paxos, those can be used in both our PSI and circuit PSI construction, and so can significantly reduce the communication overhead of those. With that, I'm concluding my talk, and I would like to thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.